All right, hyperkalemia and hyponatremia, treatments that actually work. So we're gonna talk about hyperkalemia first. And I'm not going to talk about the calcium and the dextrose and the insulin. I think we're probably relatively comfortable with those. What I'm going to talk about is elimination of potassium from the body. So you can give the patient dextrose and insulin all day, keep on repeating it, um, but eventually you need to get the potassium out. So how are you going to do that? The traditional approach to this was K-exalate, which was initially based on faulty evidence and never really worked. And this is a great, really fascinating example of a therapy which was used for decades and was probably mostly a placebo therapy. The bottom line on K-exalate, um, just so we're clear on this, is that maybe it has some sort of role in chronic hyperkalemia, but it does not work for acute hyperkalemia. So if you have a patient with moderate or severe hyperkalemia and you need to get the potassium down, k is not going to help you. I've not used this drug for several years currently. Um, and I think probably most folks would agree with that at this point in time. So now that we don't have k anymore, we need some way to get the potassium out. And the best approach to that currently seems to be calioresis, which is removal of the potassium through the urine. And the way this works is really very simple. Um, we're going to give the patient some fluid. We're going to give the patient various diuretics, and hopefully they're going to produce a ton of urine with a lot of potassium in it. And we're basically just trying to flush potassium out of the body through the kidneys. So the first part is what fluid should we use? Now, traditionally, it has been taught that hyperkalemia is a contraindication to lactated ringers and you should use normal saline for hyperkalemia. And in my view, that's completely wrong and it's actually backwards. And there's a whole blog about this. I'm not going to go into all of it right now, but the short version is that normal saline has actually been shown in randomized control trials in the operating room to cause hyperkalemia. And the way that normal saline causes hyperkalemia is by causing acidosis that causes potassium to shift out of cells. So I would suggest that normal saline is actually contraindicated in hyperkalemia and lactated ringers is a superior fluid to normal saline in this situation. However, we often encounter patients who are acidotic and hyperkalemic. And for these folks, I think the best fluid is isotonic bicarbonate. And what that is, is a liter of D5 water with three amps of bicarb added to it to create a solution of 150 MEQs per liter of sodium bicarb. So this is an isotonic solution um, of sodium bicarb. And this has been shown to reduce potassium. And parenthetically, I actually think this works. And it works by a couple different mechanisms. So first of all, it's going to volume expand the patient. It's going to fix their acidosis. It's going to dilute the potassium a bit. And it may actually cause some shifting of the potassium back into the cells. So to summarize, with regard to fluid, if your patient is hypovolemic, um, these are the fluids which I would recommend. If the bicarb is low, if they're acidotic, I think isotonic bicarbonate is a good choice. That's the D5 with three amps of bicarb. If their bicarb is normal, if their pH status is relatively normal, then I think you could use some sort of balanced crystalloid, your lactated ringers, plasmolite, normosol, whatever balanced crystalloid makes you happy. So that's the fluid part. What about the diuretic part? Unfortunately, most of our diuretics cause hypokalemia. Um, and I'm sure that we've all encountered this when we're treating patients with CHF and we give them diuretics and they dump potassium like crazy. Normally that's a pain when we're treating our patients with CHF, but now we're actually going to take advantage of that to our benefit. Um, a combination, so furosemide is typically the main backbone diuretic that you're going to use, and certainly furosemide causes potassium wasting. Thiazide is the second agent um, that you're also going to throw in there, it may synergize with furosemide. Um, and then if you really want to go whole, whole hog, you can add some acetazolamide um, that may cause some bicarb to be spilled in the tubule, and that can actually improve um, potassium excretion as well. Fludrocortisone is a mineral corticoid that may encourage potassium secretion in the distal tubule. Um, I will sometimes add this, especially if the patient has been on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, may potentially counteract those drugs. 
Um, not super great evidence. I don't think you absolutely need to use that, but if you're really up against the wall, you could throw it in there. So this leads us to the concept of the nephron bomb. Um, and the nephron bomb is for a patient with critical hyperkalemia where you essentially have one chance to diurese this patient or they are going to need dialysis. So you have one shot to give them a ton of diuretics and hopefully they'll produce urine and get better. If they don't get, you know, produce urine, then, you know, they're going to need dialysis. So you really want to be pretty aggressive here. And this is my, my typical nephron bomb, a bunch of IV Lasix, some IV chlorothiazide, um, IV acetazolamide, and maybe some fludrocortisone for good measure. Just to be clear though, you don't need to use the nephron bomb for patients with mild to moderate hyperkalemia. So your folks with moderate hyperkalemia may do perfectly fine with, you know, a bit of lactated ringers and a bit of IV Lasix. Um, so you don't need to necessarily go crazy. This is for those patients where you have a short time frame in which you need to try to fix them as best you can. If the nephron bomb works, they're going, the patient's going to produce a ton of urine, which is great, but you have to make sure to keep up with it. Um, because the goal here is to secrete potassium. It is not to volume deplete the patient. Um, so if you give the nephron bomb, then like walk out of the hospital and forget about it, you may come back the next day, your patient's gonna be incredibly hypovolemic. Um, so the game here is basically replace the patient's urinary losses, typically with lactated ringers, um, and keep an eye on their electrolytes. Patients, they can actually go from being hyperkalemic to hypokalemic, keep an eye on their magnesium, um, I might even check their FOS too. I mean, you're, you're being pretty aggressive with the nephron bomb, um, so you can cause a lot of electrolytic problems, and that's fine as long as you monitor their electrolytes and you know, replace whatever needs to be replaced. All right, so our next stop is hyponatremia. And for me, I think the most challenging thing about hyponatremia is really prevention of osmotic demyelination syndrome. If the patient is initially symptomatic, you can usually give them some boluses of you know, 3% or some sort of hypertonic fluid, and that's relatively easy to manage. I think the real challenge here is preventing these folks from going too high too fast in developing osmotic demyelination syndrome. So let's talk about how that happens because we need to understand the physiology before we can try to prevent it. And when I was a resident, I always used to prevent, believe that osmotic demyelination syndrome was my fault. So if I gave the patient too much 3% sodium, that was going to push their sodium too high and cause osmotic demyelination. And what I know now is that, you know, 3% sodium is actually a lot less potent than people think it is. And it would be incredibly difficult to give a patient enough 3% to actually have that 3% cause osmotic demyelination. The physiology of osmotic demyelination is totally different. This is the way it actually happens. So you have a patient who comes in they're hypovolemic. That hypovolemia stimulates their brain to produce vasopressin. So the brain is trying to support the circulation. It's pumping out vasopressin. The brain essentially prioritizes perfusion over tonicity. So it says, I'd rather this patient be a little hyponatremic and perfuse their body than have you know, normal tonicity and be in shock. So the, the brain produces vasopressin. This causes the kidneys to retain water and that is what causes them to be hyponatremic. So this is the patient's physiology walking in the door. They're in shock, they're pumping out vasopressin, their kidneys are not producing a lot of free water. Now, you come along, or you know, someone gives this patient a couple liters of fluid, and what happens? Now suddenly the patient's no longer in shock, they're kind of no longer hypovolemic. The brain is happy, the brain's getting perfused, so it stops producing vasopressin. So now suddenly the kidney has no vasopressin on board. It realizes the fact that this patient is hyponatremic and it dumps water. And this is what causes osmotic demyelination. Osmotic demyelination is caused by the kidney pouring out free water. It is not caused by the clinician giving 3% sodium. And who overcorrects? You know, anyone who has a reversible pathology for hyponatremia. These are the folks who are at risk for overcorrecting. So classically, this is hypovolemia. Um, patients with thiazide can do this. Um, and then patients with a water solute mismatch, so your um, polydipsia patients, you know, your psychosis polydipsia, your beer potomania patients, and finally your tea and toast patients who just are not taking enough solute. 
Um, all of these are kind of reversible pathologies. Once you fix the problem, the kidney is normal and it's going to correct extremely rapidly. So traditionally, the approach to these patients who overcorrect has been to try to give them D5 water and essentially try to keep up with the kidney. So the kidney's pouring out water and we're going to essentially pour in water and try to kind of maintain some sort of balance. Um, and personally, I have to say that I've had very little success with this. If the patient has a normal kidney and that kidney is pouring out water, it's gonna win. Um, you're gonna go to sleep and they're gonna dump like four liters of water. You're gonna wake up the next morning and their sodium is gonna be much, much higher than you wanted it to be. So, so personally, I've had relatively little success wrestling with kidneys and trying to force water on them. Um, some people have, you know, but I think this is a, kind of a, a faulty approach, honestly. I think it's, it's difficult to make that work. So the approach that I prefer, um, and this is what I call the DDAVP clamp, um, is we give the patient DDAVP desmopressin to essentially replace the vasopressin, and this causes them to shut off their free water excretion. So this is going to prevent them from overcorrecting. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is, this is wacky. So we're going to give DDAVP to a patient who's hyponatremic, but, but you might wonder, like, DDAVP causes hyponatremia. So this, what, what's going on here? The first couple of times I did this, everyone in the ICU was convinced that I had lost my mind um, because I was giving DDAVP to a patient who was hyponatremic. Um, but the way this works is simple. Our goal is to take the kidney out of the equation. So once the kidney is out of the equation, we can treat the hyponatremia by giving intravenous 3% saline. Um, and the beauty of that is that we can do it in a controlled fashion. So when the, patient, when the patient's kidneys are free to do whatever they want, all of those predictive equations do not work. Um, because all of the predictive equations don't take into account what the kidney is doing on its own. However, if you give the patient DDAVP and if you take the kidneys out of the picture, then suddenly all of those predict predictive equations about how much 3% to use or how much you know, normal saline to use, all of those equations are basically going to work. So what you can do is you can give the patient DDAVP and this allows you to plot out a course you know, figure out how much 3% you want to use, what rate you want to use it at, start it, and it's going to basically work. The patient will stay more or less where you want them to be, um, and they're not going to veer wildly off course. Um, and there are a variety of different formulas out there, um, and the, it's, it's really not that difficult. Basically, you're checking the patient's sodium, you figure out what rate you want them to correct at. Usually, you're going to shoot for going up by six MEQs every 24 hours. If the patient's sodium is higher than you want, then you give them free water. If the patient's sodium is too low and you want it to go up, then you give them 3%. And if the patient's sodium is kind of where you want it and you want it to stay the same, then you do nothing. Um, so it's really just a matter of slowly watching the patient's sodium, figuring out what you want it to do and giving it whatever fluid you want to make it do that. One caveat is that these patients need to be fluid restricted. So if you give them DDAVP and then they drink a bunch of water, then you're going to once again lose control. And that's bad. The whole concept of the DDAVP clamp is you're taking control, you're taking the kidneys out of the picture, you're taking the eyes and nose out of the picture. You should be the person who's dictating what this patient's renal physiology does. There are a couple different ways that the DDAVP clamp can be used. Probably the most common way that the, the clamp is used is what I call a reactive DDAVP strategy. So the patient comes in, you treat them, whatever, give them some saline or do whatever you know your therapy is, and then suddenly you see that this patient's overcorrecting. And then at that point, you put on the DDAVP clamp, um, and often by the time you're putting on the clamp here, the patient's kind of corrected as much as you want them to correct for a while. So you kind of put on the DDAVP and just leave it there for a while, um, and maybe you add some 3% or, or something up here. But the key here is that you're initially treating them without DDAVP, and this has some benefits. It allows you to see how they respond to therapy. So for example, if you, you know, give them some normal saline 
and their sodium goes down, that might suggest the patient actually has, you know, SIEDH, for example. Um, whereas if you give them some saline and their sodium just, you know, shoots right up, maybe they're alcoholic or hypovolemic. So, so sometimes it can be useful diagnostically to kind of get a sense of, of what they're doing. Um, but once you see them skyrocketing, you know you're in trouble and then you need to put the DDABP clamp on. This is what I would call a proactive strategy. Um, so this is a patient who walks in the door and gets clamped right up front. Um, and I would consider this for a patient with profound hyponatremia who really seems to have some sort of reversible etiology. For example, you know, an elderly woman who comes in on thiazide diuretics with a sodium of 100 and no neurologic symptoms, who's clearly been sitting at a sodium of 100 for months or weeks. Um, so it's chronic hyponatremia, high risk of osmotic demyelination, uh, very low sodium, reversible pathology. So these are all things that are gonna make me very scared about osmotic demyelination. Um, so the most aggressive thing that you can do to prevent osmotic demyelination is to put the clamp on immediately. Um, this gets you complete control, then you put on your hypertonic infusion, um, and then you just cycle their sodium forever and, and kind of titrate it up, titrate it down, and um, that's pretty straightforward. And finally, another strategy here is a proactive DDAVP strategy where somebody comes in with symptomatic hyponatremia. These folks, you're oftentimes going to want to bolus them with something hypertonic. You want to get their sodium up rapidly. But once you get their sodium up and they're asymptomatic, then you want to clamp them and kind of keep them there for a while. So I think the bottom line here is that DDAVP can be used in a variety of different ways. I don't think there's any right way to use it specifically. Um, I think as long as you understand the physiology of the kidney and you use it in some sort of a logical fashion, um, it can work. And this is an extremely powerful technique. And I think once you start using this, you'll realize, you know, how it takes like a complex situation and it really makes it relatively easy. Um, a couple situations not to use the DTAVP clamp for. So I'd say if the patient has mild hyponatremia, if their sodium is over 120, I probably wouldn't bother. Um, and I think the other thing is if the patient has chronic CHF or chronic cirrhosis, um, you know, then they're not going to autocorrect on their on their own. So there's really no point in using the DTABP clamp. And, and most of your folks with CHF and cirrhosis are going to have mild hyponatremia anyway. So um, I wouldn't get too, too excited about the clamp and use it on every single patient. Um, you know, so, so that's it. So, um, so our treatment for hyperkalemia is going to be fluid, diuret, diuresis. We're going to try to produce as much urine as possible. And our treatment for critical hyponatremia may be the exact opposite. So we're, we're giving DDAVP and essentially trying to reduce free water output. So kidneys helping us and here the kidney in some ways is, is hurting us. Um, all right, thanks a lot.